And God is the healer and the deliverer. And he had listened to the tape, so he figured that out and found out God is good all the time. And with that, I just loved on him and I kept getting my hair done, whatever. And I'm sharing here and there. And they're like, oh, 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 Vito. I go, no, Vito will speak. That tongue will be made loose. God wants him to speak. People came up to me when I was paying my bill and they said, Vito told everyone that you prayed for him. He's been going around from station to station telling everybody she prayed for me. He couldn't, he couldn't really speak. So then before I left, I laid hands on him and prayed over him again. He came back, I would say, about 10 days later, and he was talking like this. And they were like, oh my gosh, Vito. I saw him yesterday, and he, his speech is improving. They told him he would never speak again. Now, his wife was there, and I started to minister to her and love on her and tell her. She goes, well, you know, God only gives us what we can take. I said, sweetheart. But see, people, this is what you have to understand. They don't know the truth. Hello? I said, sweetheart, Jesus is the Savior, the healer, the deliverer. Why would he counteract, make you sick, only to make you well? I said, He's not schizo. He doesn't have a double personality. I, she said, you know, I never thought of that. I said, why would you pray to someone that made you sick? She's like, I, I said, because there's a devil. And I started to share with her. There's a devil. He kills. He steals. Destroy. I went to Genesis the, to explain how evil came into the world. But you have to understand something. And 25 minutes later, we went from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. And she's like, and I had other, other girls listening. They're like, oh, my gosh. This makes so much sense. But yet, what you have to understand it, we're privileged. We know the truth. Amen. They have no idea. But all we have to do simply is share with them for, so that they can be set free. The girl, Debbie, that does my hair, she goes, everything you said, it just makes so much sense. I said, yeah, because that's what the word says. People don't know what's really in the Bible because you only heard from your grandmother or you go to this church or that church in tradition. So with that little, I, I just got off on a tangent, but I just want to let you know there is a world out there and it was so easy to share. It's so easy. You all know the truth and the truth, you know, share it with others on your job, in the playground, at school, when you're shopping, when you're online, you know, you hear, I hear people say things all the time and I listen, I turn around and start talking to them. That's your open door. He's giving us the open door to share the love and the truth so that these people who God loves so much can be set free. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And just like Taraka said, you know, believe and receive. You have the faith to believe. You have the faith to receive. We've got to let those people out there know they can have the same thing we have. Amen? Hallelujah. With that, I'd like to say I'm Pastor Annie, and this is Pastor Dan, and we would love to welcome our first-time visitors. So if you are visiting with us for the very first time, could you kindly stand up for one moment? We would love, love, love to welcome you. Hallelujah. We welcome you. We have a welcome package for you all, and once you received your welcome package, then you all may be seated. Inside, you're going to find a CD, which is going to be a teaching on the Word of God, which will tell you the truth, and the truth will set you free. You'll also find in there um, a little brochure, which will tell you all about Faith Exchange Fellowship and the family here, and how the Lord will use you in the most unlovely, dark, ungodly places, because that's the way God is. He wants the truth to be known throughout mankind. Pastor Dan and I were um, on mission boards doing things all around the world for the Lord, and the Lord said, what about here in New York City? What about the people here? Pastor Dan was a commodities trader trading in the World Trade Towers, and he started to bring his Bible into the pits, the trading pits, and every Tuesday, by the mandate of the Most High, he sent out a good newsletter to all the different traders and all the different employees and told them all about the goodness of God. And if they needed prayer, it was non-denominational. Why don't you come up to my office after the trading day to find out about God, the Father who loves you? Well, people started to come after the trading day on a Tuesday afternoon, 
up to his office, and we had guest speakers, we had healing services, he ministered the word of God, we had prayer, and people on the exchanges in the towers were saved, delivered, and set free. People from the outside said, we want to come too. Can't we come? Well, because when you obey God, God will open doors that no man can shut. He will make a way where there is no way for the things that he wants done for you in your life and for you to be a blessing. We were allowed, after about a year and a half of having just the Bible study for the traders, to open it up to the public from the people outside. And they started to come on a Tuesday evening into the World Trade Towers to hear the word of God. And this went on for 10 years or more in the World Trade Towers where people heard the word of God and that's where faith exchange fellowship was born on the commodity exchanges. So I'm here to tell you, you think, oh, how can I, how can I minister to my employee? Oh, how can my, I tell my hairdresser about the love of God? All you have to do is take that first step and God will open that door for you. So I want to welcome you to faith exchange fellowship. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love that testimony. It's a great one. Also for our visitors, there's a visitor's information card. Please fill this out. Put it in the offering basket. You'll get on our a mailing list. You'll get our mini magazine. It's filled with the word of God. It has testimonies, praise reports. You will also find out about all the exciting things that are going on here in New York City, which is Christ Town, the city of righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. And you'll always get a teaching in here in the Hebrew because that's the living language of God. And Yahweh said, I am that I am Yahweh. Go tell my people. So I encourage you, please get on our mailing list. Um, our services are here at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We start with intercessory prayer. You can come and pray and intercede for the service, for the people that have yet to walk into these doors, for the volunteers, for everything, the vision of God that he has here at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And then at 1030, we be begin with worship followed by the word of God, which of course is the most important thing. Hallelujah. But you got to come to praise him. He loves to be praised. Don't you like when somebody praises you and says, wow, you did a great job. Wow. I really like you. Wow. I really love you. Well, the Lord loves to be praised too. He really Hallelujah. does. And boy, he is worthy of all praise. Amen. Amen. So don't miss intercess. Don't miss praise in the Lord. Hallelujah. Wednesday evenings. Also, we meet here at 7 30 PM for our midweek service. This last past Wednesday, I ministered on let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. Amen. If you missed it, I encourage you to get the, the teaching because uh, a delay is not a denial. But if you don't have patience, a lot of times you'll get a counterfeit blessing, which is not what the Lord has for you. You want God's covenant best blessings. So you have to let patience have its perfect work. You can get that CD downstairs. Hallelujah. Also, our Deeper Life Conference, all the CDs are available down at the book table. We now have the barley green. You know, I spoke on how you can keep your body healthy God's way. Barley green is available downstairs. And the hallelujah diet, which will get you on the right track to eating properly, along with the CD, the teaching that I had. God wants you healthy and whole and to live in divine health all the days of your life. That's his plan for you and me. Hallelujah. Sunday, November 9th at 10.30 a.m. will be our next miracle healing service. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I encourage you to come and bring all those that need healing in their bodies or their minds and watch the Lord heal, deliver, and set people free. Hallelujah. Sunday, I hear November 23rd is Pastor Appreciation Day. Yay. Whoa. We get to appreciate the pastors. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please, please, please. If you call us pastor out there in your nice cuddly pajamas on your nice cozy bed and you live in this vicinity, could you please come? I would love to see you. So would Pastor Dan on November 23rd. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We will have refreshments and beverages and fun and fellowship after that service. Glory to God. Also, please a reminder. Sow some seed into our Navajo Christmas blessing. We are believing God to bless a hundred families with a gigantic Christmas package sent to each home filled with Christmas gifts 
and blessings for each Navajo family. Sow your seed, extra seed into this project. We need volunteers. You can sign up downstairs to help wrap the gifts and package the gifts, which I have not purchased yet. So I'm believing God that we're going to be able to have that done. And my target date is December the 7th. So that's Sunday um, after service. I'm believing maybe we can get together and start wrapping the gifts and get, get the ball rolling so that they can get these beautiful presents. You know, when they receive our newsletter, they feel like that is a gift. They told me the last time we were out there, they said, oh, they, they hang it up. They put it in frames. So how much more blessing will they receive when we send them a huge package filled with goodies just to bless them? We get to. We, we get to bless others. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And remember, he always gives seed to the sower. So you all have seed in your pocket to sow again and again and again. Hallelujah. Praise God. With that, let's welcome Pastor Dan. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can you fix you? Fix me. Fix you up. Oh, wow. How you doing? There you go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You guys can be seated. We're going to get right into the word today. Hallelujah. Let's give a, a big hand to our praise and worship team this morning. Uh, didn't they do a wonderful job? As they always do. Here's a scripture that I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. I want you to get this deep in your spirit. Then we're going to work through the word a little bit this morning. Uh, I feel like I did in the old days where praise and worship used to be an athletic event for me. So I have a little bit of uh, moisture here. So if I took my sweater off, I'm glad no one can see it. My wife says no one can see it, so stop talking about it. All right, good. Second Chronicles 20. The last half of that verse, they would call it verse 20, B, if you will. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believing the word of God will establish you. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Let me help you with that. Someone who is a prophet is going to speak on behalf of God, and they're going to speak the word of God. Be careful of prophets that speak words into your life that try to tickle your ears. Make sure that everything is scriptural. And I, and I heard the other day, uh, somebody was talking about, an old member from here was talking about, you know, call into this number and get your daily prophecy. And I was like, whoa. You know, as an apostle, someone who is uh, assigned to build something, uh, I've been building this presence, this church, since the 80s, really. And when you get an assignment, you don't really want to get another assignment until the assignment you already have is done. You know what I'm saying? So getting, you know, it's kind of like when I'm doing work at home, I don't really like my wife to pile onto my list while I'm already working the list that she's given me. You know how that feels? But when these people are prophesying things over and over again, for those of us who are doers in the kingdom of God, we feel honor bound to do more. And so we, you have to be careful about daily prophecies. You have to be consistent in that. So believe in the Lord, so shall you be established. Believe the prophets, so shall you be what? Prosperous. So, and so shall you prosper. Depending on, and you shall prosper. Prosperity needs to be defined properly. It isn't just financial prosperity. It's spiritual, physical. It means, it means you should be healthy. Beloved above all things, I wish that you be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers, right? He wants us to have prosperity, but he wants us to be spiritual prosperity. What is spiritual prosperity? It means you have an ongoing, fulfilling, exciting relationship with God in prayer at all times, right? I mean, you are excited to go to church. You are excited to pray. You are excited to praise. You are excited to give. You are excited to share the gospel. And, and you can tell that in that, the reward of that is hearing his voice. So that you are where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, equipped to do 
what God wants you to do in that situation. So that's a really powerful thing. So that's a prosperity or form of prosperity. Same thing with physical. Mental prosperity is the ability to learn. But not just the ability to learn, but the desire to learn. I find a lot of times, especially in today's society, that Christians are falling down on their ability to defend the gospel or to talk about the gospel in the marketplace. Um, we have to be careful because it wasn't that long ago that the teachings of the gospel were the primary, was the primary vocabulary of the marketplace. It was the primary vocabulary of education. It was the pri primary vocabulary of um, the arts. Science was the primary vocabulary. Everybody framed everything according to the Bible, but that is not so today. Since the 1800s, since the move of, uh, of atheism and secularism, uh, the, the vocabulary has changed. So when we leave the church, we have to realize that people will automatically, uh, they will automatically assume that if you have a belief in a higher power, if you believe in God, if you believe in Yeshua, that you have a form of prejudice that they automatically discount you. But you have to not be moved by that. Because you have the truth. Now, like if, if I was to line up on a, on a talk show, a lawyer, an artist, a professor, if I was to put a doctor on the stage, if I was to put, and we were going to talk about how to fix the things of society, and on that stage also was a minister. The people that are viewing, because of the way that the vocabulary has been changed in our school system, in our newspapers, on media, they would immediately assume that the one person who was the most prejudiced would be the minister. And, or ignorant, as my wife just said, and that's actually true. The least educated. Because they value that which is secular over that which is divine. They value things that are easily experienced or easily educated into people rather than what can be revealed by God. And we have to learn that when they try to disqualify us, we have to learn not to be intimidated by that. Because you actually have love, you actually have truth, and you have actually have the answers. And the fact is, wherever I go, I was just in this past week, I was in a conference of innovators and uh, inventors in the area of the power grid, electricity. And they are trying to create, not that they're trying, they are creating a system where electricity can be delivered uh, in a much more efficient manner. But it, it, not only that, but it allows people to not only be buyers of electricity, but it allows more and more people to be sellers of electricity, educating people how to set up solar, how to set up generators, how to set up wind on their property. And not only that, but they can create on your meter, they can create a point of sale to create an international or global marketplace where everybody is finally given equal footing. Now imagine what that is because that's, that's it's almost like the internet for the marketplace where everybody, because everybody needs power. For example, the Navajo Nation, 40% of the people do not have electricity and they don't have running water. But this will allow very inexpensive electricity and running water to be delivered to people all over the world that currently don't have it. The Ebola situation, what's going on with the Ebola? People are getting sick because they don't have the normal hospitals, they don't have the normal ways to care for these people. Well, this ought not be so in 2014. However, if this is built on the back of secularism, then it'll be built on a on a lower moral ground, so we have to we have to impregnate that thought process, those exchange principles with the gospel of Jesus Christ in a vocabulary that those people can understand. Hence, prosperity, spiritual, physical, mental. We have to develop our secular vocabularies. We cannot just say, well, this is what God said, and then back out of the conversation. Because they want us out of the conversation. They're happy if we do that. So you have to kind of learn their language to teach them the Bible again because the universities today are teaching God out of the system. They've taken Frederick Nietzsche's writing, there is no God, 
and they have exalted that up. And in the United States, it has taken a long time for this to come to our shores, but it's been in Europe for a long time. 2% of Switzerland are, are Christians today, 2%. Compare that to the United States. Isn't that crazy? Yes. So we have, they have a church in, in Switzerland, 2% of the people believe. Okay, and this used to be a Christian nation. And so the, the power of secularism is, secularism is taking over. So we as believers, we must believe that we carry true treasures in these earthen bodies, when we carry the scriptures, as we opened in praise and worship this morning, it's a beautiful thing to pass the microphones and have everybody praise on a scripture that flows out of their spirit. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. As we just continue to understand that carrying the definitions of the gospel, carrying the definitions of the book of Proverbs, carrying the definitions that come from the Bible is really going to save this world from a lot, of, a lot of headaches. One of the biggest proponents of there is, proponents of there is no God was a man named Adolf Hitler. And he used to, his whole goal was, I want to create a, a race of young men and women who have no moral conscience. where there is no right or wrong except for what I tell them. But that's where secularism will take you where because right or wrong becomes relative. What is right or wrong? And that's when you can get to the point where you can say, well, that isn't life, that's a choice. For those of you who want to disagree without me on that, it is life. It is a choice. But when we can start talking about it in secular terms and it's no longer biblical terms, then we're in trouble. Everywhere that I go, in my intellectual circus being, cir circles being, uh, being a Yale graduate, is everywhere I go, they want to argue either about abortion or homosexuality. They want, they, because they want to disqualify me for the rest of the time that I'm there as a minister. Problem is, is I won't let them do it. I just say, look, I'm not going to argue with you. They're like, well, what are you talking about? Let, let me just close up both these conversations right off the... You and I both know that it's life. All right? You guys want to argue about when life starts? I'm just telling you, it's life, and you know it's life. So we don't want to argue about the terminology. And we also know that this other one is perversion. Even if you call it love, it's still not the way it was designed to be. Those parts weren't meant to go in those parts. But I'm not judging either of those cases. If a, if a young lady were to have an abortion in this church, I would love her and tell her to come to church. We would never ostracize her. At, at any point, in any stage. Same thing with... with a gay person, they're welcome in this church. Come to church, hear the word of God. We're going to love you. We don't judge you. You're not going to get to preach homosexuality from the pulpit or in my children's church. But you can come to church and we'll welcome you. And we've had that. For many years, we had a transgender sitting on first or second row. We, we don't, we don't, the Bible doesn't stop loving anybody Amen. and you have to understand you have to know these little anecdotal stories you have to know these things when the world tries to disqualify you and you cannot let them do it believe in the Lord and what that means is study his word praise his name and keep him on the forefront of your thoughts at all times Pastor Annie, I, I had to take a little bit of an umbrage with what you said. The Lord does not need to be praised. He needs you to praise Him. There's a difference. He needs you to praise Him so that at all times, He is your top priority. But He doesn't need your praise. I mean, my goodness. You can't even fathom who He is. So when you say He's great... You're not even touching 
who he is. You're great. Yeah, all right, thanks. As if you would know what great is. Right? You're amazing. No, he, he loves that we love him, but he loves that we love him because he loves us so much and he knows our way up and out is through putting him first. So he doesn't need to be praised as much as he needs us to praise him. Does that make sense? So you just have to, he, he doesn't, he's not like a, a megalomaniac sitting up there going, oh, look at the people praising me. Satan is like that. Satan wants to be praised. He is like that. He loves to be praised. He was an old praiser himself. He was a leader of worship. So he loves when that praise is on him. But, but God loves the praise because he recognizes that when you praise him, you're putting your mind Focusing it on love and light and life and truth, where all deliverance is. He's our protection. He's our provider. He's our covering. He's great. He's awesome. Right? He's mighty. He's holy. He's righteous. Hallelujah. He's truth. He's my answer. He's awesome, right? Savior of the whole world, giver of salvation. He's awesome. See, what you're doing when you're doing that is you're not praising the opposite, which is, oh my God, my bills are piling up. Oh my goodness, I need to go to the doctor and get yet another prescription. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, worry, right? Anxiety, fear. Oh, no, my God is able to make all grace abound towards me so that I will always, in all situations, have everything I need so that I can give to every good work. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be 100% acceptable in your sight, my Elohim, my God, and my Redeemer. You're going to buy me back out of my sin every time I mess up. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, you already did it. Hallelujah. Go with me now to Psalm 111. Psalm 111. Anybody like the book of Psalms? Since we've been talking about praising, right? I will praise Yahweh. Whenever we see the word the Lord in there, notice that the, all four letters are capitalized. That comes from the Hebrew tetragrammaton, the yud heh vav -Hey. So you can always cross out the Lord and put in yud heh vav -Hey. part, part of the problem with the word the Lord is because the word Baal also comes from the word the Lord, right? You even get Allah from that word. Hallelujah. So we have to be careful. You have to know something. You have to know that you know that you know that you know. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was raised on the third day, and he's seated forever in heaven. He was the one who taught, love your enemies. He was the one who taught, turn the other cheek. He was the one that taught, take no clothes, take no, just trust me, I will take care of you. Muhammad is not in that place. Muhammad was a warrior. On one day alone, he killed 600 Jews by beheading them. Yes, he, did. he is not a man of peace. I don't care what the word, they tell you what the word Islam means. So you, even though there are a lot of good Islamic people, Muhammad wasn't one of them. Now you and I both know if I said that in another country, thank God for the United States of America, what would happen to me? I would get my head cut off. What does that tell you? So don't say that when you're overseas. <laughs> That's funny, but it's not funny. Write that one down. Believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. I mean, I'm not even kidding, you know. We have to be careful. I mean, yes, there are a lot of good Islamic people, but there are also some people that, are, that do good things that are not, you know, that are just taught wrong. Exactly. There are some good people that are atheists, yet they, they will, actually, I was just putting it up, but they are just, um, they're, they could do good things, 
They can hand out food in a, in a, on Thanksgiving Day. They can visit people in the hospital and make people feel better. Right? They can maybe even pay somebody's rent once in a while. Wonderful, right? But there is none good but God. Now, we know that because we've heard that scripture. But in the long run, we have to know how things are going to affect things. We love our cell phones. Don't we love our cell phones? I love our cell We love our cell phones, except for the fact that they might be killing certain parts of the food chain that's going to eventually make man extinct. Oh, wow. I'm not saying it's true, but it's possible. We didn't test it first. But boy, do we love our cell phones. But we got no hummingbees. No, hummingbirds and, and bumblebees. And without those things, we don't get pop pollination. Oops. Hello. Right? We just got to be careful. We can't be so hasty. We can't put money ahead of truth. We've got to keep things a little simpler. Slow down a little bit. Remember the Bible was written by somebody who sits on time, who's ahead of time, who knows about tomorrow. Amen. The cool thing about, <laughs> you know, if you, re if, you, if you read Jesus and you read Muhammad, here's what Jesus says, I will be raised on the third day, and he was. That's right, he was, yes. Amen. Because he's made, he, he was only saying what his father told him to say. But the thing about your God is he forecasts and he fulfills. He's not telling you what happened before. He can tell you what's happening tomorrow. So he's coming again. And there is a judgment day. But for those of us who believe that will be, oh, happy. Come on, Carolyn. Oh, happy day. You know what I'm saying? When Jesus, you know, you know I try to be black, but you know I'm white. It's all good. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. It's all good. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The assembly of the people who believe are the assembly of the upright. The works of Yahweh are great, studied by all who pleasure in them. See, it's not enough to just visit the word. You have to study it to show yourself approved. You have to love it. You have to, you have to hunger and thirst after it. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. I, I just don't understand. I mean, the greatest scientists in the world that are today, including people like Stephen Hawking, go to church these days. And the reason they do is because the more they study science, the more they realize there's a grand design to it. And even though they don't come to it from churchy language or religious tradition, which a lot of times puts us into bondage, by the way, we have to be careful not to put ourselves into a different kind of slavery to words that we don't really understand. See, the reason we have to learn secular vocabulary is because we love the people who don't love God. We don't hate them. They're not our enemies. You know, we should pity the fools. Amen. We should feel sorry for them. That they don't know the love of God. And I don't mean pity them in a condescending way. I, you should just have amazing sympathy for them. I love watching, sometimes I catch this on Facebook where I'll, you'll catch a praise session of soldiers wherever they are. They don't just praise the Lord like in a, some kind of Catholic church, you know. Come Holy Ghost, Creator, No, there. There. We are in the army of the Lord. And their, their hands are up and they're praising even the white folks. They are praising God. They need to be praising. And they're, I mean, I'm telling you, it, it's wonderful. Annie and I were just with the Navajo. And it's funny because you watch them. 
they're, they're at first they're kind of, but then you start praising in, in Navajo and they start getting animated. You start teaching them about what praise really is and what it really does for you and how it elevates you to the place beyond fear, beyond anxiety, beyond sickness, beyond poverty. Man, they get, they get pretty wired up. It gives them protection. Yes. Even these reserved individuals, they start praising. Habashni, Habashni, Habashni Abenigo, Habashni Abeniago. See, I can do it now. I could praise in, in Navajo. It's just, it's just a wonderful thing. But the people, then see what that does is that allows the Navajo people to come across and they can hear from two white people that they've been trained to, to not trust. Because you learn in their language. Secularists are being trained not to trust us. If you were to go over to Israel or even over into the Middle East, Secularists by history have been trained not to trust the Christians. Even people of faith, Islamic people, Jewish people, they've been trained not to trust Christians. How can you not trust love your enemy? Well, Mahatma Gandhi said it best. Everyone would be a Christian if it weren't for the Christians. We have to be better Christians. We have to bring love, not judgment. We have to bring a listening ear and an, and an intelligent response according to how they see the world. In the Quran, Jesus is the Messiah. Did you know that? The only woman in the Quran is Mary, Jesus' mother. You need to know these things. Because when we come in contact, and I mean we, we all come in contact with people, we are affecting the other people's witness. If you're not a strong witness, if you can't defend the gospel, you're going to make it more difficult for somebody who is a strong witness. You don't get to stink at this. Say amen. That's why you can't just have a gospel of consumerism. I go to church because I need my rent paid. I go to church because I need to get healed. I go to church because I might find a mate. I go to church because I am, I am, my name is Jimmy, gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> right? No, we, we have a role to play. We are part of the body of Christ. We have to represent. Yes, Amen? Represent. Amen. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. Now we're getting into the New Testament. Anybody like Mark? Yes. I like Mark, right? In this church, we have a, an exercise that we do. It's called the red letters. So we're going to do a little red letters right now. And I preached this, uh, I think it was last year in October for the Deeper Life Conference. But I'm going to say it again. Mark chapter 1, verse 15 says, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Amen. Mm. I love this because it comes. Here's Jesus, you know. His first cousin, John, is already in jail. It says it in verse 14. And Jesus doesn't come out preaching against Herod. He doesn't come out preaching against the, Jew, the Jewish people or the Romans. He just begins to state... The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And that's an important aspect because you must recognize that you have been on many levels secularized. Anybody here go to school? Yes. Public school? Yes. Anybody here go to university? All right, your, your thought processes have been secularized. Your definitions of the world have been secularized. The only thing that can get you back to a divine vocabulary is the Bible. But the Bible read through secular eyes is secularized. 
You know what secular means? Secular means a worldview outside of the belief in a higher power. Taking God out of the marketplace, taking God out of the schools, taking God out of everything. I mean, when an atheist can say, we, we can't talk about God because I'm offended. I want to say, well, you're in my school, I'm offended, please don't come. But I, I wouldn't even say that because that's not how I feel. See, God is a person. Since when is God not welcome? I mean, he, he's only keeping the earth, you know, rotating around the sun, <laughs> putting air in your lungs. He's only keeping your heart beating. I mean, I mean, he's doing his job. We really don't want to push him out of the thing, you know what I mean? He's welcome in my house. He protects my wife. He keeps her deluded so she still loves me. It's pretty good, right? Not diluted, but deluded. You know, D-E-L-U-D-E-D, -E -E right? Amen. I am confessing that. She said, don't confess that. She said, I want, I want you to always love me. That's all I'm saying. Come on. Honey, don't let the facts get in the way of a funny joke. All right. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. I want to welcome all our first visitors who aren't used to this preaching style where your wife heckles you from the front row. I just want you to know it happens here at Faith Exchange only. You can't get this at any other church. It's the only place in America where the wife heckles the senior pastor on the front row. So you are in the right spot. I'm telling you right now, where else can you get that? Special. Very special. Hallelujah. Now, if you go over to verse 17, you'll see the next red letters now. When you begin to believe the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Follow me, Jesus said. I will make you to become fishers of men. Now, a lot of Christians, they don't want to be fishers of men. So what happens to them when they hear that they think right off the bat, I don't want that. That's why the next red letters come in. It says, be quiet. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Be quiet. You must be a fisher of men. Right. You know, in this church, the information that you receive is secondary to the impartation you receive. Let me explain that. I could teach you historically, I could teach you um, contextually, I can frame things up for you so you can do, but it's not about that. What you want to do is you want to understand that the Holy Spirit, God himself, attaches himself to himself in you. So to impart God to you, which is what you want, you want God on the scene in your life. Because when you hit a tough time, you need God. You don't need information. You need a person. You need help. You need impartation. And he comes. But the word that we teach you, it's not for you to grapple around it and try to understand it intellectually. It's for you to receive it and believe it so God can attach to it. That's called the impartation. And Jesus taught. Of course he taught. Jesus preached he taught and he healed. But more than that, he lived a life in front of the people who followed him. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, which means walk with me, run with me, be with me daily, minute to minute. When I sleep, you sleep. When I go off to pray, you pay attention, you go off to pray. When I go off to pray, you stay awake. Right? You pay attention. Watch what I do, not just what I say. You know, children are good at that. They don't learn just when you're teaching they, right. or just when you're speaking. They learn a lot of times by what, by what you don't say. You can't say one thing and do another. Amen. Amen. All right, now let's go to Ecclesiastes, to the left in your Bible. Chapter 11. Again, for some of you, we have a reading um, schedule that we stay on every month, and I teach from that reading schedule. 
and it's part of our Deeper Life program. So if those of you who are paying attention, we're, we have the book of Ecclesiastes, we have uh, the Corinthians, both 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and the book of Mark for this month. Of course, the Proverbs are always on our list. Chapter 11, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight. For you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, the, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb or her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. So in the morning sow your seed and in the evening do not withhold your hand for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Amen. And what those things... What Ecclesiastes, the, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes is saying, is he's saying, follow instructions. Don't look outside to see whether you should follow instructions or not. Because there's always going to be something that's going on outside that will give you an excuse not to do the right thing that will bring you prosperity. Come on, in the summer, it's too hot to go to church. In the winter, it's too cold. When it's raining, it's too wet. When it's not raining, you're going to get sunburned. Always a reason not to go to church. Always a reason not to go to church. If you're, if you're walking through your house, and oh my gosh, I'm too tired to pray. Oh no, oh no, I feel too good to pray. I might as well go outside today. Right? So, you know, uh, oh my goodness, I need this money for this, I need this money for that. See, if you're always looking out here, you're not going to do what's really going to prosper you. Amen. There is none good but God. Amen. Every good and perfect God comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. God is not a man that he can lie. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He put all of creation together. He's already put your blessing out there. He's giving you a few instructions to make sure that you truly prosper spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and financially. But we keep looking to the wind. We keep reading the papers. We keep going to college to try to get some information. We keep looking out there when we know for a fact they're practicing medicine. Sometimes on you. Right? But God knows. He's the healer. He's the provider. And he's put together a simple system. And that's why we have to love him with our whole heart. That's what it said in Psalm 111. Worship the Lord with your whole heart. Pursue him with your whole heart. Love, the, love God all the way with your, your, all your strength, all your, your thoughts, all your body, everything that you are. Love him. And then once you start doing that, begin to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. So it says here in verse 9, it says... Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know, but know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. I mean, Ecclesiastes is a little bit sarcastic. You know, he says, rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways and do anything you want. Do what you, what you see. But just remember that God's going to judge you for it. <laughs> but remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. You like that word vanity? It's a sweet word, isn't it? Yeah. I think of it like a, a vanity. Isn't it nice? It's like a mirror with drawers. All these combs and everything. You know, and beautiful women sit there and they just brush their hair for hours in front of a vanity, right? 
paintbrush, you know, and they were taught when they had long hair, you know, a hundred strokes per section, you know. And they would just sit there and they would sit in front of the vanity, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall. <laughs> Who's the fairest of them all, right? See, but it's a beautiful piece of furniture nonetheless, right? But it, that word vanity to us doesn't mean what it should mean. It should mean stupid usefulness, uselessness. If you don't worship God in your youth, it's, it's just you're not being trained right. It thrills me when I hear Paige worshiping God now at 22, 23, 24 years old, whatever she is now. She keeps growing. She's getting older. How many now? 24. She's 24 now. She's been here for a while, you know. I mean, I mean, I've been preaching this, and Danielle, when she, she goes to prayer over an exam, or she goes to the scriptures when she's writing a paper, and she, she, has to, and she goes to a very secular, liberal school, but you see the scripture in the writings, but she's learned how to do it without writing the numbers on them. And she's still getting A's on paper, because God's word is truth. And truth is truth, and, it will, and truth is wise. And the great thing is, is that most of these professors have never read the scripture, so they can't even tell when she's doing it. <laughs> Somebody say true. There was a time when that wasn't true. I love when people say, oh, I've read the Bible. Oh, good. You read it once? Yeah. So you're an expert. You read the Bible to say what? That it didn't affect you? I, I, I just got to read the Bible so that I can say I read the Bible. I'm like, that's awesome. Praise God. You know, Manuel Kant and David Hume and all these great philosophers who try to prove there is no God cannot keep the earth rotating around the sun. You know, scientists are going to church these days because they're on a journey. They're actually hungering and thirsting for truth. It's, this, it's the people who aren't hungering and thirsting for truth that we, should, we need to have conversation with. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You guys getting something out of this today? Yes. You are, and here's the point of today's message, if, if, I, if I can make sure to just put it in the, you are a carrier of the truth. You have to love that truth. You have to know that the truth that you carry is life itself. It is love. It is, it is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer to ISIS. It's the answer to Ebola. It's the answer to uh, our decaying water supply. It's the answer. Because right now, we have people that are in charge of these things that are that are being led not by being a good steward over the planet, but they're being led by, you know, shareholders and, and short-term silliness. You have to understand, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall remain. What is the most annoying things about being a Christian? Time. Seed and harvest, we like it's the time in between we don't like it's the fact that there's a gestation period there's a fact that you know you sow and you don't know when you're going to reap you just don't know when you know it's like the book of Ecclesiastes it's like just work the principles and you'll be blessed but we don't want to work the principles and we'll be blessed whenever we want to work the principles and be blessed like right away yeah Right? Yeah. Now is a good time, Lord. <laughs> now is good. Now is good again. <laughs> right? But the thing is, is that's not how any, er, anything worked. Has never worked that way. Right. And so as we begin to really get okay with that, we have to realize that there's all sorts of truth and you can't just test it and then look outside and see if it works. It works. Say it works. It works. The Bible's true. The Bible's true. It works. it works. Believe in the Lord, so shall you be established. 
believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. See, believing in the Lord is, is going to the Bible, developing your own prayer life. The prophet is what I'm doing right now is I'm highlighting some things. I'm putting some things back on in your conscious, your conscious mind. You know, you have a subconscious. You have a part of you that, that has been affected. It's a part of you that, that keeps your heart beating, keeps your, all your body working. It just works without you really having a thought about it. Then there's your conscious mind where you have to think about things to do it. Last night I, I got very congested for whatever reason. And I couldn't breathe through my nose. It was really annoying me. And then it started to annoy my wife because I was trying to clear my nose while she was sleeping. <laughs> so what annoys me started to annoy her. Maybe that's why she's heckling me today. Maybe, I don't know. She's just... No, you were great. You were so sweet. You are always sweet. Even when she greeted this mo me this morning, it was with a warm cup of coffee. And she actually said, you look really cute this morning. <laughs> She says the nicest things. Yeah. It's all the truth. <laughs> you can't get this in any other church. You can't get this. This is unique to Faith Exchange, I'm telling you. Yes, I am unique. That's right. And God, when God made me, he said, it was good. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Cause and effect is not as simple as you think. And when you look at it from a secular view or when you're looking at it from your circumstances, you're going to make mistakes. The Bible says, what a man sows, that shall he reap. Right? Secularism says what goes around comes around. Right? You'll get yours. Right? So they negativize it or they, they make it negative and then they but they try to steal all the truth that's in the Bible. But the fact is, what you sow shall so shall you reap. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? What you believe is what you're gonna think. Believing actually is at the subconscious level. So if you're afraid at the at the subconscious level, you have to work on that in the conscious level to change that. Right? So, so some, some scientists even who work on these concepts, the, the subconscious, the conscious, they've created another mind called the superconscious, which is basically the kind of mind that connects to divinity. Or, you know, a lot of people will call it the mind because they don't want to give a Christian worldview, but they'll say it's connecting to God and then they'll slash universe. Right? Because they don't want God to be a person, you know. But, but we know that God is omnipresent, right? So out of God came the universe. Oops. So I don't, you want to call him universe? That's fine with me. One verse, there is one God, I'm good with it. All right? But see, this is called understanding their vocabulary. I don't want to debunk them. They're, 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 on a, they're on an honest search, and they're discovering God. They're just trying to change the vocabulary. They want a vocabulary that suits their worldview, which is not a Christian worldview, even though that we know that Jesus was raised from the dead. Somebody had to pay the price so that they could even come to this place where they could even study this out. So let them hunt. Let them search. Help them along the way. And it's okay for you to study a lot of this stuff that they're working on. As long as you remember that Jesus is Lord. That's right. Say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, and we all know that the poor will be with us also and that not everybody's going to accept Jesus. But that doesn't make Jesus anything else but the Lord. Right? He's still Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Okay. Verse, chapter 4, 1 Corinthians, and we're getting ready to close up. You guys getting some stuff out of this this morning? Have you learned a few things this morning? Good message. See, you're the head, not the tail. 
head. Say, I'm the head. Not the tail. Not the tail. No matter what my professor says. I'm the head and not the tail. No matter what my boss says, I'm the head and not the tail. Right? You're not stupid because you believe in God. Quite the contrary. Wisdom himself is personified in Jesus and on the inside of you. And you guys all know that I even struggle to use the word Jesus because I know his name is Yeshua. But I'd use it because we got new people here today, but also because a lot of people identify with that name more than they do the name Yeshua, even though Jesus mean, has been secularized. The translators way back when were trying to take the power out of the name. But we in this church know where the power is. Yahshua is the name that he was given by, the, by God through an angel to Mary. Mary was not allowed to name Jesus Duke. <laughs> or whatever she wanted to name him. Right? God did not leave it up to her to name him. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants, stewards. That's who we are. We are stewards of the mysteries of God in us. God on us, God in us. We are stewards of that truth. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Every man will speak of his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. A faithful man is a man who is single-minded. A man who thinks what God teaches, God has given us, what Jesus has highlighted, and, and we think along the lines of God and we speak the same way. single-minded man his faith is in the heart and in the mouth that's how you get saved that's how you get filled with the holy ghost that's how you get prayers answered is that you get your conscious and your subconscious to line up and you speak it out in connection with your super conscious mind which is god's word now, I know I'm messing with the secularists' vocabulary, and they wouldn't like the way that I'm defining it, but they're eventually going to discover that the way that I'm explaining it is, way, is the way it is. There is God's mind, my conscious mind, my subconscious mind. I just need to get my conscious mind to agree with his mind, and then I've got to believe it enough so that I can wipe out all the fear and all the silliness that was that has been beat into my, my subconscious by training from the time I was very young. You know, the more, I, the more I learn about this, the more I realize that I have subconscious fears that cause me to shoot myself in the foot over and over and over again. Cause me to fail, cause me to, to, to slow down when I should speed up, cause me to speed up when I should slow down. And we all have that. And the more you can become aware of it, and the more that you can agree with the superconscious. See, the superconscious says you can do all things. That's right. That's Your subconscious says you can't do anything. Yeah. Your superconscious says everything, every good and perfect gift has been given to you. Your subconscious says, not me, why me? I, I never get anything. Right, And so you've just got to get your, your conscious to agree with your superconscious long enough so you change your subconscious. And change in behavior is a hard thing to do. You ever tried to break a habit? Not that easy to do. You have to replace it with a new habit in your conscious mind, but you can't just pick something out of the air. You gotta go to something that's true. So you gotta connect to the superconscious to find something true that's worth changing to. Does that make sense? Found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court, in fact. This is Paul talking. I don't even judge myself. For I know, I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. 
You know, my name's Daniel. Did you know that? Yes. Some people call me Dan. Some people call me Strats. <laughs> Some people call me the Strapper. My nickname's over the years. No tarts. That's Stratton backwards. I've had a lot of nicknames in my NAD, no tarts, as a matter of fact. I could probably speak backwards. We did for a year and a half in my high school, so. But Daniel is my name. But what Daniel has done for me, unbeknownst to me, it has given me a place where I'm not that concerned what you think of me. Because it means, the word Dan in Hebrew means judge. The E in the middle of it, dan e, means my judge. The word El is the Hebrew word for mighty or for God, Elohim, right? So God is my judge. You're not my judge. I'm not my judge. God's my judge. Now, I used to take that as God is judging me. Oh, I'm in big trouble, right? But I don't get that anymore. See, God made me. He likes me. And he, because he's my judge, my job is just to present to him. He likes it. It, it, it gives me freedom. Because I don't write to you anymore. I don't preach to you anymore. I preach to him. I live to him. And he is a lot less judgmental than you. He loves all people. Church people can sometimes be the most judgmental people I have ever met. My wife said, not us, not here. I said, well, we can be if we're not careful. We have to choose not to be consciously. Because we can fall into our own traps if we don't love first. We have to love our enemy. We have to love the atheist. We have to love those who oppose the gospel. People who are anti-God. People who are a-God. People who are against him. People who are against you because of him. We got to love them anyway, and we got to do it in a way. I got to tell you, you got to take this stance. When they attack you, you cannot be offended. You got to pity the fool. Some of you don't know who I'm referring to there. Mr. T back then. You got to be a little older to know who this is. Maybe you got to watch some old cable of the A team. He had kind of a semi-arrowhead mohawk that he used to wear. He used to say it like this, Pity the fool! Yes, amen, yes. So maybe that'll help. Maybe if you say that into Google somewhere, it'll come up and you'll know what I'm talking about. I don't know, they could probably do that these days, voice recognition. But you really have to feel that way about people who don't know God. It's, I mean, if you see somebody who's hungry, you want to give them food, right? see somebody who's, I've seen on the streets of, of New York, people who are actually fully naked. Yes. You want to give them clothes. Yes, you do. Right? Well, if somebody doesn't have God, and they're telling you you're an idiot, you should feel like they're naked. Yes. Or hungry. Yes. You, you shouldn't feel attacked like they're smarter than you, and somehow they're going to get to disqualify you. Rather, you've got to make sure, you got to show them love. The same kind of compassion you would show the naked or the hungry, you got to show the ignorant, the uninformed, or the overly informed and indoctrinated, and indoctrinated to a lie. Because what you believe is true. Amen. Say what I believe is true. See, to believe is to actually believe. If you're not convinced, you're going to be knocked off your game. Are you convinced? It's too late for me. I've seen too many miracles. I've just seen too many miracles. Oh, there is no, you know what, when somebody says to me there is no God, you know what, it doesn't intimidate me. I start laughing. Ah! See, what these verses are saying from Ecclesiastes, from the, start doing the right thing before adversity hits. 
Sow your seed before you need a harvest. Cast your bread upon the waters because it's the right thing to do whether you understand it or not so that you have the harvest on the day you need it. Begin to worship the Lord day in and day out, not just on Sunday and Wednesday nights, but begin to put these things into practice every day, all day. Find yourself, getting yourself, I loved what happened today in praise and worship where, where Taraka, because he was performing last night, he's got to perform later today, and he didn't have wheels to get to church. I said, don't, just, just don't worry about it. You'll get there when you get there. Neither you sing or you won't. And so I sent my wife over to pick him up and bring him to church. Not because I wanted him here for praise and worship. I just wanted him here. And if he'd have said, no, I'm going to stay home, I'd have been fine with that too because he's always here. But if he wanted to be here, I wanted to make sure he could get here. And when he got here, aren't you glad he did? Because he came, he came full of the Holy Ghost. And he wanted to praise. And he's a pretty good praiser even when he doesn't have his guitar. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. You know, it's fun to be led by the Lord. Okay, watch this. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until Yahweh the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. And that's the verse I want to close with. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. Seed time and harvest shall always remain. Day and night, cold and heat. His instructions are yea and amen. Amen. Father, we praise you and we thank you in the name of Yeshua that we have learned of you today. I thank you for you are good and your mercy endures forever. I thank you for the message that you bring forth, the way that you anoint it, the way that you teach it. We thank you for it. Now, as we get ready to sow our tithes and our offerings today, we know that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest remain, and we know that when we're obedient to give, that it shall be given again unto us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together shall men give into our bosom hallelujah and as we give today all of us are trained in it we know that when we tithe the windows of heaven are open to us the devourer is rebuked and and he sh and king shall talk about us amen thank you Lord. amen we know that when we give offerings that 30 60 and 100 fold is promised to us with persecutions but Many are the afflictions of the righteous, and he shall deliver us out of them all. So the fact of the matter is, 30, 60, and 100 fold are promised to us. Now, when we give our first fruits, our first fruits are given to our, the people that preach the gospel to us. We don't get a tax write off for these, but it will sanctify everything after that. A first fruit is something when you get a new job, when you get a new client, a new stream of income. You take that first piece of it and you give it to. If, it's, if, if Annie and I are your pastors, you give it to somebody who's really sowing the word into your life, and you believe it. And the fourth way of giving is when you give to the poor. And the Bible says if you give to the poor, God will give you your money back. So the, we always give to the poor through church, which is what Pastor Annie just said in front here. But the idea is, yes, we give to the poor. In a lot of ways, giving to the poor, we should do corporately. You give to us, then we'll make sure it gets out to the poor. We did a lot for Superstorm Sandy. We do a lot on a regular basis. It's no problem, but you shouldn't take your tithe or your offering and give it to the poor. It should be separate and over and above that. Amen? Does that make sense? Are you ready to sow your seed this morning? One of the things sometimes you can forget is that giving is worship. So you must... As a matter of fact, in Hebrew, the word avodah is the word for work and the word for worship. They're the same word. So when you give of your substance, you give of the money that you worked for, it is a form of worship. So when you give this morning, make sure you worship with your giving. Say, Lord, I give this to you freely. I love you with all my heart. 
Yes, I, I received the promises for the tithe. I received the promises for the offering. I received the promises for the first fruit. I received the promises for giving to the poor. But I don't do it for that reason. I give it to you because I love you. I don't do it because I have to, because I know I don't have to. I don't have to get saved. I don't have to do anything. I do it because I'm informed and I love you and I'm following instructions. Amen? 2014. 2014 is my best year yet. Not the best year I'll ever have, but my best year till now. Spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and financially, by far. This year, I'm coming out of debt. For the rest of my life, I won't get sick. My family members are getting saved. My household is whole, safe, strong, influential in Yeshua's name. And we prosper in everything we put our hand to in Yeshua's name. Go ahead and serve the people. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. of Yahweh is here the presence of Yahweh is here I can feel it in the atmosphere the presence of Yahweh is here of Yahweh is here. The Spirit of Yahweh is here, alive inside me. The Spirit of Yahweh is here. I can feel it in my inner atmosphere yes the spirit of Yahweh is here the spirit of Yahweh is here the truth of Yahweh lives here yes lives right here I can feel it living in my atmosphere the truth of Yahweh lives here the truth of Yahweh lives here Father, I just pray over this offering right now. I thank you, God, that everybody did the best they could today. We're grateful for that. Thank you that all of their need is met according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I thank you that they're the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. Everything they put their hand to do shall prosper. They dwell in the secret place of the Most High, Yah, under the shadow of the Almighty. And I say, Yah, that you are their refuge, you are their fortress, in whom they put all their trust. No evil shall befall them, no plague come nigh them, no tragedy come nigh their dwelling place. For they live in you, Yah. This is the heritage of the saints in Yahweh. And I thank you, Yah. Everything they put their hand to prospers. In Yeshua's name, say, I receive that blessing. Hallelujah. I call the hundredfold return over every seed in here right now. Say, I receive it. Amen. You are dismissed, but we're going to praise the Lord a little bit. You are dismissed. Hallelujah. Hug two or three people on your way out. Ask them how they are. Wait for
for the answer.